keep going. I'm working at a lot slower pace now, but I keep trying to push myself and make sure that I'm creating the amount of work that I did in grad school. The quality is getting better because I can spend more time with it, but working in series, kind of trying new things, play, play is such an important part of my work. What is up, Shaping Nation? This is Nick Torres here, and on this episode of Shaping Your Pottery, i got to interview Courtney Segrist. Courtney makes some really incredible chain themed pottery that is functional and also sculptural at the same exact time. In this episode, you will learn how Courtney makes her chain themed pottery. You also learn about why you need to learn to slow down so you go faster later. And you also learn about the power of repetition, how that can truly make something beautiful. And finally, you also learn about not getting too comfortable with what you are making. And there's so much more in this episode. I hope you guys enjoy it. I'll see you guys in there. Courtney... Welcome to Shaping Your Pottery, and share with me, what is something you love besides making pottery? I really enjoy kind of like, I'm a hobby hopper sort of, so I just pick up on things here and there and stick with them for a few months, but lately I've been doing to like sewing, crocheting, I've always loved reading, so books are always something I go to when I'm not making. Absolutely love it. So tell me the story how you got started making pottery. I was at the University of Oklahoma, and I was an art student, thought I was going to do painting, drawing, sculpture, that kind of stuff. And then I had to take a beginning ceramics class for the major, and I absolutely hated it. It was horrendous. I Everything was breaking. It was cracking. Nothing was turning out how I wanted it to, as with clay. And it was like, I got really annoyed with it and it was that annoyance that really pushed me to want to understand it more and then I had to take another clay class over the summer for an extra credit and that was the class that really kind of made me love clay because you have so much babysitting with clay you have to moderate the moisture levels um, when to attach things how fast you let them dry out Um, and it was that kind of like babysitting that really dragged me in and made me want to pursue clay absolutely love it I definitely agree with you about like the messing up made you want to like make me want yeah. to do it more to figure it out. I got so irritated that I just couldn't do it. Feel that on a, like a personal level. Yes. I love that. And I ended up changing my major when I was a, in my last year of college to clay, and I like hyperloaded my course to make it happen. It was awesome. I love it. So. Tell me about the moment when you decided to get your MFA at the University of North Texas. Yeah, so I really love the academic environment. I just feel like it exposes you to so many people, so many voices that you otherwise wouldn't have seen or heard from. Um, And of course, there's like great facilities within that environment. I'm from Oklahoma, so I wanted to stay close to home. Family is very important to me. So I was mostly looking at Texas and Kansas as my two like top two schools. I ended up getting into both of them. I chose Texas because of the committee that's there. There's Brooks Oliver, Elisa Au, and Valerie Baines Hancock. And they are just, they are a very strong front. And I love them so much. That's what made me decide to go to Texas. So how did this experience help you with your own pottery? It pushed me much harder than I ever thought it would. It's a rapid paced environment where you're just making, making, making. You can't think too much about what's going on. You just got to keep going. And I think it's really easy as a potter to get kind of like stopped up and like get too far in your head and kind of get stuck on one piece but within this environment it pushed me to like just throw it aside put it on the back burner and move on to the next one so I think it really just helped me to keep pushing forward Um, and there's all these voices there like I said earlier um, to kind of help and guide you Um, and it just really helped me push in a better direction so what is something you learned from this time that you still use today Ooh, I think something that I learned was to just keep going. I'm working at a lot slower pace now, but I keep trying to push myself and make sure that I'm creating the amount of work that I did in grad school. The quality is getting better because I can spend more time with it, but working in series, kind of trying new things, play, play is such an important part of my work. Works is a huge advocate about keeping play in your studio to help you develop new ideas and also just like not get stuck on pieces and not really like hate the process um so if i ever sitting here making something i'm like oh this could be cool i go ahead and just try it um just playing around is what i really enjoy so how do you incorporate this play into the busy schedule of trying to make a bunch of pots 
uh, it's hard. I get distracted very easily in the studio. So I have to set some guidelines for myself. Like, oh, I need to throw these 10, 20 cups before I'm allowed to do something else. Um, so it's usually setting my calendar, my agenda for the day, um, getting what needs to be done first, and then not allowing myself to like kind of play with maybe the pieces that didn't work out or I like threw it a little bit too thick. Play with those uh, so that I know I would have scrapped them anyway. A lot of, I like making jewelry in the studio too. And a lot of those pieces come from just like little scraps that I had sitting on my table and would have gone in like the recycle bin or the trash otherwise. So it's kind of stuff that I just fiddle around with as I'm letting pieces dry out too. Absolutely love that. Shaping Nation, if you want to start incorporating play into your work, get the hard things done first exactly. out of the way so that you have time to play. I love exactly. that Exactly. So but sometimes, some so, days it's harder than others. I'm just sitting there like, oh man, I feel so bored with this. I can't do it. So those days I let myself just go ahead and have a play day. I love that so much. So let's talk about your pottery. In one sentence, can you tell me what you make? I make in a functional ceramics um, that helps the user kind of meditate in the current moment they are in. Helps them slow down. Perfect one sentence. So tell me a story how you started making the pottery that you make today. I, it's kind of a funny story. So I was making, in my undergrad, I was making a lot of these really big, tall vases. I love throwing. I consider myself a solely a thrower. Um, and then I slammed my thumb in my car door and I broke it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I can't throw for a while. And then I was helping um, our professors there make a soda kiln and I dropped a really heavy metal channel on my middle finger. So I was like, okay, wow, my hand is really out of commission right now. So I started hand building because I could do that with these fingers. Um, so of course I wasn't going to take time off. And then I stumbled across some artists, Ruth Borgenick, Cecile Kimperink, and I started kind of making these clay coils and rings and interlocking them. I was really obsessed with crocheting and fabric at the time, and I was trying to make that in ceramics. Um, so I just started making these blankets of little coils, and it's kind of evolved from there. So I was like, I really want this on functional pottery. How can I make that happen? And it's just like these joining of two different ideas. I love that. That's a <laughs> that's a crazy story. So you are inspired by interact by the interactions we have with objects in everyday life. How does this impact the way you make your pottery? I am really interested in these moments where we slow down and, and just embrace the moment that we're in. Kind of like these moments of like a drink of coffee in the morning. We usually rush through that, speed on to the next thing. So I think I want to make my work something that focuses you that forces you to slow down and embrace the moment you're in. Um, so a lot of my cups will have these like really long chainmail skirts on them that kind of like weigh, physically weigh you down. Um, and it's very fragile and precarious. So it's something you have to be aware of how you're holding it and what you're doing when you are holding it. Um, a lot of people are scared of like fragility with ceramics because I think it's something that can be easily broken. But I really love it because it just makes you that much aware of the object that's in your hands. And when we're that aware of something that's around us, um, it just forces us to really, really slow down, be mindful of our own bodies and space. So you mentioned that people are afraid of fragility in ceramics, and that is definitely true. So what helped you with getting over this? It's a lot of understanding that Things do break, but that also makes them a lot more precious. I have a whole wall of cups that I've bought over the years that I've dropped or broken, but I still keep them around because there's a memories associated with that. It's a lot of the experiences that we tie to objects. And even if that experience has changed where this object is no longer functional, it still serves as a memory holder. Um, so I don't think an object's life dies whenever it's broken. So I think that helps me understand that fragility is okay in clay because um, most of the time people are just going after that that experience, that moment in time. I love that. Shaping Nation, it's okay to break the pot or whatever you're making because there's always still memory and there's still lessons to be learned from that broken piece mm -hmm. or that something that you made. I love that. So something I found interesting from your website is you said, my work utilizes a heightened sensory perception through sound, tactile, Tactile experience and woven patterns to encourage in introspection through handcrafted items and everyday rituals. Can you tell me more about this? Yeah, so as I was talking about earlier, that it's easy to get kind of like swept up in like 
the busy nature of our lives and kind of rush through everything. Um, and people, I have a lot of anxiety revolving around just like everyday life. Um, and something that's really helped me with that is these grounding techniques where you just focus on your senses and what's directly surrounding you and that helps ground you within the moment. Um, it makes you feel calm, um, happier. It really just gives you a different perspective on life itself. Um, so I was trying to incorporate these in my pieces by making parts of it just malleable, things that you can move around, that you can fidget, um, things that like I make these really these cups with really long skirts on them that drape all the way over your arm. Um, so they reference kind of like a weighted blanket, that sensation that there's something holding you down. So I think my hope is that by activating as many senses as I can, so you see it, you drink from it, you can move it around and be aware of it. Um, it helps bring someone into the moment a little bit better. I love that. So can you walk me through how you get the chain look onto your pots. Yeah, um, it was a lot of trial and error to get that. My best friend is the handheld clay extruder gun. Um, I was started off using the dies that come with it, but then I just wasn't getting the right shapes or sizes with them. Um, so I took a sheet of an acrylic, and when I had access to the Fab Lab at the school, I cut out a bunch of different dies with that. Um, but I've also just used a drill to cut out these kind of like random floral shaped dies um, where when you extrude from it you get these kind of lumpy bits that come off on the coil and um, from there i just sit down and i construct hundreds of thousands of ring dry rings and then i connect them together with wet run wet ones a lot of my practice is just like sitting here in the chair just doing the same thing over and over for days on end <laughs> um, so a lot of it is just getting the chain done first seeing the size of it and then building the form of it to go around it, especially with these new like fidget spinner cups that I've been making. Because it's it's hard to work with pieces when your cups are really wet and the chains are really dry because the shrinkage is different. Um, so it's a lot of measuring, changing, measuring, and changing again. It's very delicate. A lot of the times I will bisque set my forms. Um, so the cups that have like the chain skirts coming down from it, I will make the cup. I have my attachment rings around the rim. I'll bisque set that and then I'll add the um, green mar chains onto the outsides of it so then I can bisque it again. So it's also a lot of bisking. <laughs> I love that. Shaping Nation, sometimes in order to make something look incredibly good, you have to be able to repeat things a lot and over and over and over and over again to get the look you want. Yeah. And I think there's some beauty in repetition too. It comes like, it's also meditative. I find it very th therapeutic to do the same thing over and over again. Um, just cause like it's my space and it's this very like intimate space that I'm into. How long would you say it takes you to make all of your rings? <laughs> it takes a long time. I had this, so I have these really long chain skirt cups and there was one that was going into my thesis and it was like a week before my thesis and I was going to load it into the kiln and I accidentally tilted it wrong and the entire chain snapped off and broke onto the floor. And I had spent maybe two weeks on this piece and I made that piece in two days. So it depends on how much adrenaline I have coursing through my veins. <laughs> but I wanna say I've gotten down to, I can make a ring and maybe like, 30 seconds, um, depending on the size of them. Um, so I do have a lot of varieties of sizes, um, but I can make an entire like standard cup in maybe a day now. That is pretty crazy. That's actually insane. So <laughs> let's talk about discovering your voice. What would you say was your biggest obstacle when it came to discovering your own voice? I think the biggest obstacle was maybe like comparing myself to people I saw online. It's really easy to kind of like see people who've been doing this for years and years and being like, oh man, why can't I figure it out like they did? Um, but what you don't see is all the time and dedication that went into it and just kind of like doing things that make you happy. It's really hard when you have this vision in your head that you can't quite get there because your skill set isn't there yet. So kind of doing the things that you're comfortable now and then slowly starting to make it harder as you go. Um, so like I said, I started making these blankets with this chain mail and I was only ever able to work on a flat surface on a sheet because I just couldn't figure out how to move it in space without breaking it. Um, and eventually I started figuring out tips and tricks along the way. Um, so I think the best way to find the best way that I found my voice was just kind of slowly letting myself and feel uncomfortable with the process and continuing to do things that I vis I visually and physically enjoy making. I love that so much. Shaping Nation, if you will have a big idea, but you don't know how where to start, start very small and then continue working way up slowly and slowly and slowly until you're able to do it. Exactly. That is the easiest thing you can do. I love that. So you mentioned that you would compare yourself to other potters. What did you do to help you kind of get over this a little bit? 
things from online is a really big help. I found that looking at historical arts also helped too, because it's kind of like these forms and shapes that you see now, but they're more simplified and they're kind of, there's more of a distance from you and these people who made them. So you can't really compare yourself with the person of the making skill. But I think distance is just the biggest one. And it's hard when like Instagram is such a high and popular thing lately. And it's like hard to be an artist without putting your presence out there on Instagram or other social media platforms. But just allowing yourself maybe like an hour on those apps a day and then just like forcing yourself to be in your own headspace for the rest of it. And also just like, yeah, exactly. Great advice right there. So can you tell me about the moment when you knew you were heading in the right direction with your pottery? I became so much more happier. I... When I was making pottery just to make pottery, it was oftentimes I get it out of the kiln and I'll be like, yay, awesome, into my closet you go, or hide it at my parents' house or something. But I really started to feel like this excitement, like that Christmas morning buzz when you open a kiln. And I was like, oh, this is getting good. And then when I started to have more of a chance to interact with the pieces I made, they felt like they had more of a purpose to me. Um, and that made me really excited. And I was like, okay, we're on to something here. I love that. So you contribute your growth as an artist to never giving up when an idea is too ambitious or impossible. Can you tell me more about this? It's so hard with clay because everything is just so fragile. It's delicate. You really have to watch it and keep your eye on it. Um, So a lot of times it really is hard to stick with it, especially when you miss that one chance. There's so many stages in clay that one step can make it all go wrong. Um, And I think it's really important to just keep that visual idea in mind of what you have and just keep stretching for it. A lot of times I'll start out with a little sketch in my notebook of what I want to happen. Um, But as I'm making it, I'm starting to realize like this is not going to work now. This is impossible right now. Um, So I'll let the idea evolve into something else. I kind of like push the sketchbook away and I just don't look at it anymore. Um, So I settle for what is working and I really, really congratulate myself for those little moments. Because it's hard to, especially when the full idea isn't being resolved. Um, But if you get one out of the ten pieces working, that's awesome. So it's really just kind of like reminding yourself that you are making progress. You're in the studio. That's the biggest thing. That's the most important thing. You made it to the studio and you're making. And that's the biggest congratulatory thing that you can do. Absolutely agree. Shapey Nation, your ideas may not be coming to life right now, but you are making progress. You are making progress to making that idea come to life. It's just building it up slowly. I love it. So what is something you are doing to evolve your voice even further? not letting myself be too comfortable with what I'm making. So I had been making these really long kind of like skirted cups. I am definitely a maximalist at heart. I don't do simple things. It feels too easy almost. So I think what I started doing with this new matcha cup that was kind of inspired by my partner, because he's a minimalist by far, was to let myself do something simple and see what happens, Um, which was really hard for me, as surprising as that is. I feel like something's not good unless I dedicate hours and hours and hours onto something. Um, But there's beauty in simplicity. You can let the cups be more by letting them be simple. I can make more of them and it just makes me a lot happier. So right now my biggest challenge is kind of like simplifying things. I love that. That is excellent advice right there too. So what advice would you give to someone that is trying to look for their own unique voice with their pottery? Don't give up. Just keep doing stuff that makes you happy. It could be as simple as like if you love dogs, put a little dog head on your cup or something and then see what you do like from it. Evaluate it once it's finished and make a list of maybe like what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy, and then continue making a new piece based off of that. I think it's easier to see the evolution of pieces when you look at the piece you made prior and bounce off of that one into the next one, which it also is challenging in stream since we have such a really long um, waiting period until we can see the piece fully finished. Um, but just keep having fun, playing around, um, notice what you notice. Definitely agree. I love that advice so much. So as we are coming to a close here today, what is one thing you want to hammer home with my audience today? keep having fun clay is such a wonderful beautiful material it keeps us humble um, but there's so much to learn in it Um, and even if clay isn't your medium just keep having fun don't take yourself too seriously because it's so easy to do in these day and ages 
definitely agree. Some excellent parting words of advice. Courtney, it was so great chatting with you today. Where can my artists go and learn more about you? I have my Instagram is at Courtney, C-O-U-R-T-N-I-S-E. Um, and I also have a website, which is just Courtney. I have a TikTok, but I'm not really active on it. Haven't figured that one out yet. So Instagram and my website is probably the best two to go to.